If you are wanting to reignite the passion in your relationship, I think one of the first things you have to do is evaluate some of your beliefs and expectations around sex. And we had an entire uh, live stream we did a while back. You can find it on our YouTube channel, all about sex myths. Um, Victoria took lead on that one. So if you want to expand that, but I'm going to cover a few here. These are some common myths and misconceptions that I think get in the way of the ability to reignite some passion in your relationship. Okay, so here are some common ones here. Sex should feel natural, spontaneous, effortless, and require zero communication. There should be intense chemistry, and uh, both partners should orgasm simultaneously and be wildly satisfied. I wow. Mean, just <laughs> <laughs> normal beliefs around sex, right? I mean, have you heard any of these, Victoria? Oh, yeah, and they sound perfectly realistic, <laughs> the sarcasm. <laughs> well, I mean, where do we get these ideas? Media. Media, pornography, wait, that's Mr. Johnny Two Shoes, wait, that's not true. I know, I, I hate to burst your bubble. Um, and if you're having sex that feels that way, congratulations, um, you're a unicorn. <laughs> that's fair. I think we see this, you know, image in media, in pornography, um, in, yes. in books. I have clients that talk about the relationships and the sex lives that they're reading about in the characters in their books. And sometimes they feel jealous about, you know, what's happening in this fantasy world um, because it doesn't match their reality, which is yeah. completely normal. These are misconceptions. So we're gonna kind of talk about each one. First, you have to shift your, your expectations and your beliefs around sex. And then from there, I will give you some specific, actionable steps that you can take to reignite that spark. Okay, so the first one there, it should feel natural, spontaneous, and effortless with zero communication. Um, not everyone desires sex spontaneously. We had another live stream all about is your sex drive normal? And it really dives into more specific details on this topic. So check that one out. It is on our YouTube channel as well. And it breaks down that there are two desire types. There's the spontaneous desire type, which is desire that happens spontaneously. You just, you kind of think about sex and you feel desire for it. Um, the thought just kind of occurs to you or you see something that is pleasurable and suddenly you're in the mood. Mm -hmm. It's what we see in the media, it's what we see in pornography. It's a very common desire type that is portrayed but there's an entirely other desire type that is just as normal and just as common, which is responsive desire type. Um, this is when somebody feels desire in response to pleasure. So there needs to be some sort of pleasurable sensation happening, whether that be some version of foreplay or perhaps um, you're reading some erotica or seeing something that's sexually explicit there can be a variety of options there. Um, I should clarify the spontaneous desire type is when you feel desire in anticipation of pleasure. So one is just thinking about it, anticipating it, and the other is there is already something pleasurable happening and then you feel desire at that point. So um, if even you, if you yeah. both have spontaneous desire, mm -hmm. it still doesn't mean that you're both going to feel that spontaneous desire at the exact same time. That's and right. it's going to be spontaneous. One of you could be stressed or mm -hmm. sick or busy doing something and really can't have your t attention taken away, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it, and that is a, a valid, right? Because also that expectation that two people are going to be in the mood at the same time, spontaneously. Um, I think that happens more common in the earlier stages of a relationship, and we're gonna talk about why that is. And so it's, I could see why that becomes a misconception yeah. and an expectation in a relationship. And then when you start to transition out of that phase, it can feel like, 
oh, something's wrong, something's off here. Mm -hmm. So, good point. Okay, the other thing that we did talk about in that other live stream all about um, is your sex drive normal is this idea of our accelerator and our brakes. So there, the accelerator is what puts us into drive. It's what gets your arousal going and desire going. And brakes is what slows it down. So thinking, and that's unique to every person. So in addition to what your desire type is, knowing do I have a sensitive accelerator, meaning I get turned on somewhat easily, or my brakes are sensitive and I can kind of get thrown off and out of the mood relatively easily or not easily in the mood. Those are important things to know about yourself and your partner and all play a role into why people are not necessarily just spontaneously in the mood and ready to go in any given moment. You have to know about all of those variables for yourself uniquely as well as your partner to kind of understand what makes us tick in the sense of how do we know what is the, the best context to create in order to tap into that sexual part of ourselves? Yes, absolutely. Okay, that was a lot. And there's a lot of information in that. So check out our other live streams because you'll have a lot more to learn. And if you have any questions while you're here, please drop them in the chat and we'll clarify too. Yes. Okay, and just a few examples of, of what would hit your brakes. Stress, um, body image issues, parenting tasks, performance anxiety, feeling obligated to have sex, and there's many more that could be added, but just some common ones that we hear about, right? And mm -hmm. what hits your accelerators? Feeling desired by your partner, uh, reading erotica or you know, viewing something sexually explicit, listening to erotic stories, those could all be ways, you know, variables that hit your accelerator. Something that can help you if you're sitting here and thinking, I don't know, I don't know if I have sensitive brakes or a sensitive accelerator or what those really mean for me, uh, starting point that can help you maybe f start to figure that out would be to think about a recent sexual experience you had that felt relatively easy for you to get into the mood and ask yourself, what are some of the variables that were happening for me in that day? Was it a certain time of day? Can um, we have a comment here? To Brother, to Brother Finhos, can I call in? Uh, we don't have a we don't have a number for you to call in, um, but if you had a question or a comment you would like to ask, feel free to do so in the, in the chat right now. We also have a suggestion box that you can, you can utilize as well. Thank you for your question. Um, getting, I'm <laughs> practicing the responding to a question and then remembering what I was saying two seconds ago. It's is, hard. Uh, is, it's, is a challenge. <laughs> if anybody in the chat remembers what I was just saying two seconds ago, feel free to <laughs> remind me. I'm going to look at my notes here. Oh, good. Oh, we were talking about how you could figure out your, um, yeah. What hits your brakes versus your accelerator? What are some of the variables that you can consider in the context? Um, so think about a recent sexual experience where things felt relatively easy for you to tap into that sexual part of yourself and ask yourself, what was going on for me that day? Was there a certain time of day that maybe contributed to the easiness that you felt? Um, did you have a good night's sleep the night before? Were your kids at grandma's house? Um, did your partner engage with you in a certain way or initiate sex in a, a certain way that felt really pleasurable to you? And that can kind of help you maybe identify what was working well in that particular situation. Another way of exploring maybe your breaks, another recent sexual experience that maybe didn't feel so easy. It felt difficult, you struggled to get in the mood, maybe you felt resistant to really 
wanting to be sexual. Think about that day. What was happening in that day? Were you under a lot of stress? Um, you know, did your partner say or do something that was sort of off-putting to you? Were the kids running around screaming? I mean, you know, I don't know. Anything that could, were you overstimulated? <laughs> right, right. You could just brainstorm and think about what were the different um, situations? How were they different? And how might that help me understand more about myself? Okay. Okay, so there, the second myth here, there should be intense chemistry. Let's challenge that one. This is a common one. I think this is probably one of the most common ones that I hear about. Do you hear about this one, Victoria? Yeah, and I do feel like this is from media and from porn, right? Like, porn, they're, they're actors and they're actresses, right? And they're able to edit and cut, so they're able to cut out any awkward moments or, like, difficult transitions, things that wouldn't feel like you have a lot of chemistry, which happens yeah. in the real world. Right. Like mm -hmm. sometimes your body makes funny noises and that, that <laughs> kind of ruins the moment. <laughs> sometimes there's a piece of toilet paper stuck to your genitals or somebody <laughs> farts or you bump heads as you're changing, you know, positions like this is real life sex with real life people. And right. it's all very normal. And but I think when we think about this idea of chemistry, it's just this like magical thing that's supposed to exist. And we all kind of assume you should have it and you either have it or you don't, that um, there's no way to fabricate it or create it. And if you feel like you don't have it, well, then your, your relationship has died and it's time to move on. And I think that um, is a misconception in and of itself that in reality, um, you know, there's, there's a reason why we feel intense emotions towards somebody at certain given times and, and why we feel kind of comfortable and relaxed and like nothing super exciting is going on. Time and place for both. So we're gonna talk about why in the early stages of relationships we have that heightened intensity. Um, so in the early days of your relationship, you have surging serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine hormones. And these all contribute to a sense of lust. Now here's, I mean, we all love this, right? I mean, new relationship energy that you think about. That's the whole can't sleep, eat, drink without thinking about you. I, you know, can't keep my hands off of you. It's lovely. It's wonderful. It's intoxicating. <laughs> it's dangerous, but... <laughs> It can only last, it typically lasts one to three years, a maximum of three years. Wow, a three years sounds like a long time. It does sound like a really, like I almost want to challenge that. Like it, please tell us in the chat if you experienced yeah. intense lust for three years, solid. I would love to ask you some questions. Even a year, <laughs> from what I've heard, it's like the average is like three months, but it's also I know that's really? way different from a year to three years, right? Yeah, but it probably depends too on how often you're you're seeing someone. Mr. Johnny Two Shoes, can I start now? What do you mean? Can I start? Like start your lust phase now? <laughs> <laughs> do we just three years, three of, years lust. of lust? Three years of lust. Yeah. Three years sounds like a long time, but maybe it depends too on like how frequently you're seeing someone. There's um, probably a lot of variables, right? When you yeah. think about as you, I mean, we can make some assumptions here, but every relationship is unique. The longer you're with someone, the more enmeshed your lives generally become, right? So um, maybe you're moving in together. You're now sharing a lot of like domestic household tasks you are perhaps having children together, you're having to talk about the finances and, you know, who's gonna call the plumber because, you know, the bathtub faucet isn't working. I mean, these are not very sexy conversations. Yeah. So your relationship evolves and changes. So perhaps if you were dating somebody for three years and maybe not having to manage those other pieces of a relationship, then you could 
sustain maybe a little bit more of the lust energy. And that will probably become clear as we continue to talk about kind of what elicits that more lustful energy in a relationship. But those neurotransmitters of those hormones eventually get replaced with oxytocin and vasopressin. And these are designed to help us relax and bond, hence mm. our sense of love. So you have this heightened lust, lots of hormones that create that intensity and that feeling of lust. And then they kind of get transferred over into other hormones that create more of a, a longer lasting bonding type of love. Have you heard of gender differences for this too? Um, I've heard of some differences in terms of the oxytocin versus vasopressin. I want to say that men tend to have more of the vasopressin That's versus what I've heard too. women with oxytocin. Mm -hmm. I've heard that as well. And I've heard that they are like triggered via different things too. Mm. Like I've heard that women are really bonding with oxytocin through like physical touch through sex mm -hmm. and men are bonded through vasopressin through like problem solving together. Like that kind of, isn't that so isn't interesting? It, isn't that stereotypical? <laughs> Let me fix all your problems and we'll bond for life. <laughs> and you're like, no, I just want you to listen. I don't want you to fix it. <laughs> oh, very gender stereotypical there. I, you know, there was a time when I knew more about, I think they almost interact with each other too, like the oxytocin and vasopressin, but um, <clears throat> both of those are what, you know, is the more present hormone. And once you enter more of a long-term phase of your relationship. Um, so here's the, here's the bad news. Okay. Your brain is physically incapable of maintaining the same level of lust over time. It's just not physically possible. It is going to fade you are going to experience other hormones. And one doesn't have to be better or worse than the other, it's just different. And then you have to, you have to get a little creative. You have to understand this new and different phase. Because what happens for a lot of people is they start to enter that phase where of the oxytocin, the love, the bonding, and they think, oh no, something's wrong. Oh no, we, we're losing the chemistry maybe this isn't the right person for us. We see this like with people who are like serial, you know, um, they bail after, the, you know, that initial new relationship energy wears off. And then they, you know, cause they think, oh, something's wrong. Time to find somebody who again, in, in that new relationship gives that level of lust again. Right, people get like addicted to it. Yeah, it, it is very exhilarating. Um, and it can feel really sad when you feel like you've, you've faded away from that phase of a relationship. I think that's valid as well, to miss it, to wish it could stay, and to want to find it again is a question and a concern we hear a lot in the work that we do. So we have some strategies. Um, okay, what was the other? Both partners orgasm simultaneously and are wildly satisfied. Um, you know, performance issues are normal. Your body is not a machine. You are going to have penises that go soft, vulvas that are dry. You know, somebody can't reach orgasm. Like these are normal. They happen. Um, I think if it's happening consistently, it's a consistent concern and struggle, then there's more to explore there. Um, perhaps you know, consulting with your physician or there might not be the right kind of stimulation happening when you're having sex. But otherwise, like these things happen. Um, I think it's very, 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 very normal too mm -hmm. to not have orgasms at the same time. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds really hard. If, if anyone's finding it really easy, please like let us know. <laughs> We would love to hear you if you have a simultaneous <laughs> orgasm with your partner every time. Please share. Yeah. It can happen, but I feel that it's rare because, you know, there's different lengths of time that it takes someone to achieve orgasm. One person, mm -hmm. one day it might take 40 minutes. The next day it might take three, mm -hmm. you know? So how are you going to line that up? <laughs> <laughs> some interesting math there and some, I don't know. Yeah. 
some gymnastics or something. But yeah, these are, this is normal. Um, okay. And the other thing is, you know, zero communication that, you know, again, going with this, we should just spontaneously want sex at the same time and not even have to say words and we just know what to do. This is an idea that's been sold to us and it's not accurate. Be willing to talk to your partner about your sex life. And I think some of the, you know, we could have a whole live stream on how to do that and some ways to talk about it. But I think some general advice around that is to try to keep it sexy. Talk about what you are enjoying, what you would like more of, what you appreciate about your partner and start there. Because when you can keep it um, around the positive, it feels easier to talk about and versus well, I don't feel wanted by you anymore and we don't have sex as often as we used to. And, you know, I don't know, for some reason you're like, hands turn me off. Like, like going with the negative and <laughs> something about <laughs> just nitpicking your partner and talking about how things are not working is not a helpful, productive way to approach the topic. Instead, what is working? What would you like more of? Maybe what would you like to try out? Um, differently and keep it in the positive yeah appreciation goes a long way like mm -hmm. appreciation and gratitude for what you do have mm -hmm. does go a long way in that conversation and it inspires hope when you yeah. keep it positive and thinking of how we can make things better together versus we've fallen into this deep dark hole and there's no getting out to vibe then it makes nobody really want to try or put effort in Okay, so how do we now, knowing all of this, keep the spark alive in our longer term relationships? So I really like the way Esther Perel describes um, what happens for us as humans in these long term relationships. She's fantastic. She has a bunch of TED Talks out there, written some really good books. Um, I would encourage you to check her out. But she talks about how like the human desire is to have safety and security and comfortability, a sense of home. But we also have a desire for adventure, exploration, novelty, excitement. And those two parts of ourselves have a hard time coexisting. So when we think about those, the earlier phase of a relationship when lust is more intense, we have that sense of adventure novelty and excitement because it's new it's different we're learning we're excited to see one another and when we settle out of that phase um, into the more longer lasting bonded phase we have that sense of security and safety and comfortability so now the task is how to bring in, create space in your relationship for the adventure and the exploration. That felt kind of natural and easy in the beginning, but you have to be a little bit more intentional about um, as you settle into a more long-term relationship. I think it's interesting that, especially for Americans, we have this cultural belief that if we just try hard enough, if we just persevere long enough, you know, we can achieve anything. And I mean, there might, there might yourself be, up by your bootstraps. Right. <laughs> and there might be some flaws in that, you know, belief in and of itself. But, you know, for the purposes of this topic, it's interesting that we don't apply that belief to our sex lives. We mm. seem to kind of have this I don't know if laziness is the right word, but this idea of if I just don't feel it naturally, then it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Instead of really considering how do I put some effort and intention into my sex life so that I get the results I'm, I'm hoping for, that we're moving in a direction we want to be in. So if there's one thing you take away from this, I hope it's that, that we should be putting anything good in life, right? Think about all the things that you have worked hard for and that you've accomplished. Probably took time and energy and effort and thought and intention to get there. 
and your I, sex life really isn't that different. No, we can't have this hands-off nature. Right, right. This is sort of like this mystical, magical, like, atmosphere around our sex lives. That's the whole chemistry piece. It's just like, oh, it's either there or it's not. That's it. Right. We have no control in it. Right. We have more control than we think we do. 100%. Okay. So here are some actionable steps you can take and uh, to improve your sex life and get that spark back. Mm -hmm. So the first one might seem sort of odd, but it's to reduce stress in your life. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest factors that can be hitting your brakes is stress. And we think about, generally speaking, where your relationship is going in a, in a long-term relationship often involves a great deal of stress, right? Mm -hmm. Jobs, um, you know, taking care of kids, taking care of aging parents, being really busy, having a lot of appointments, family drama. We got Thanksgiving Holidays. right around the corner. <laughs> Holidays. Let me tell you, therapists don't get more emails and phone calls than they do around the holidays and shortly right after. Everyone's like, oh my goodness, I'm related to these people. I need help. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, stress, right? So reducing that in any way you can, you might have to get creative there. It might mean really taking a hard look at different areas of your life, changing jobs, um, outsourcing help if you have family or friends that can help you, um, or hiring help if you have the financial ability, whether that be with cleaning, laundry services, child care, um, learning to say no in life to your boss, to family members, to people trying to make plans. Um, these can all be some Boundaries some are important, absolutely. I think boundaries are huge. Yeah, the more you're draining yourself because you're giving to everyone else, like the less you're going to be able mm -hmm. to give to your relationship. And I think if you have like untreated anxiety, or any other kind of mental health issue, like get some help with that, get support. Um, though all of those things could make a difference in feeling less stress in your life. Stress is, stress creates a cortisol, a hormone called cortisol, which tends to shut down unnecessary, unnecessary bodily functions. So mm -hmm. your, your libido is gonna be one of the first to go. That's not necessary for your su survival. It's gonna send all of your energy and resources to your vital organs, kind of in the core of your body. And it's just that much more difficult or impossible to enter a state of, of pleasure and become physically aroused if you're under a lot of stress and you have a lot of cortisol in your system. Right, and if you're under stress, right, like, you're probably in your head thinking about the what ifs or what's going on. And mindfulness being present in the moment is so important for pleasure and desire. A mindfulness practice would be a wonderful way to try to reduce some stress. Um, and I think you could even build that into, you know, prior to expecting to have sex with your partner, like practice some mindfulness, take 10 yeah. minutes and do some a mindfulness exercise or some great apps out there headspace is one what are, are there some that you've heard of victoria insight something i don't remember besides headspace but there's also guided meditations or guided mindfulness activities on youtube as a well ton on youtube um and i think calm. it would be fun too you can do it with your partner right mm -hmm. like mindfulness is just being present in the moment present with your senses mm -hmm. your partner can give you a massage and you can be really mindful and present into what that feels like and you can even practice communicating after too mm -hmm. there was an, a book that i did not finish reading i am ashamed to admit but it was called better sex through mindfulness and it was specifically for women but it was a very heavily like sciencey research based book mm -hmm. and the narrator was i listened to the audiobook the narrator was quite boring and it was just it was very hard to get through that book but um an entire <laughs> book and a very long book written all about how mindfulness scientifically has been shown through research to improve the sex lives of women um 
So there's some, there's something to it. It cannot hurt. It can only help. And I don't know if you're planning on touching upon this, but when you're first in a relationship, I think it's really easy to be mindful because you're so excited and you're learning about them and you're trying to get to know them. So you're honed in, right? Like what are their tics? What are they like? What are they thinking of me? You're honed into it. You're mindful. So it's way easier to have that desire and to have that pleasure versus when you're in maybe a longer term relationship, you know that person, right? Like you know their tics, you probably know how they're feeling about you. You're not so honed in, right? right. Um, and so it's easier to be off in your brain thinking about work or thinking about family, not right. present in the moment, causing that desire or that pleasure. Exactly. You're not, you know, <laughs> did I leave the laundry in the washer? <laughs> did I put it in the dryer? You know, like you're not <laughs> in the middle of sex and you're like, wait, did I, did I do the groceries for this week? Like those are, you know, intrusive thoughts that interrupt. And if you're stressed, they're more likely to happen. Um, that get you into your head and out of your body and into your head. You want to get mindfulness helps kind of teach you to um, quiet your mind a bit or identify distracting thoughts and let them go and return your focus and energy onto your body and bodily sensations that you're feeling. Which, of course, if you if you think of that, that is going to improve your sexual experience if if the sensations are pleasurable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're, we're hoping and assuming, but we'll Which get to that. Which comes down one. to communication. Communication, yes. And yes. education, too. Yeah, I think. absolutely. Um, okay, so reducing stress. The other, so that's one area to focus on. The other is to try new things together. And I'm not even necessarily talking about sexual things. Just the simple idea of trying new things together puts you both in a place of like, we're kind of stepping out of our comfort zone. We're taking a risk together. Maybe we're learning, uh, we're going to a cooking class or we're learning a new hobby together or we're taking a dance class together. I would love to hear from anyone in the chat um, or anyone viewing right now, if they've tried any new activities with their partners that you feel like kind of ignited a little bit of new relationship energy, um, that sense of novelty that you have when you are trying something new together, you can kind of transfer that energy into the bedroom. It, it makes it a little bit easier to do that. Maybe you're going hiking together. Um, I don't know, schedule a wine tasting, just something new and different. And to do that, as Esther Perel would say, do that often enough but not too often that you feel like chaos and like you're dysregulated. You want to be like doing something new and different like every night of the week. Um, yeah. And that makes sense because that creates some adventure, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is what you were touching upon earlier. Traveling. There's another one. If you can, <laughs> even if it's a day trip, you know, get a new change of scenery. Go explore yeah. a new town together. Go antiquing if you've never done it whatever it might be yeah and I think it's helpful too because of like associations right if you're in a long-term relationship if you guys are living together maybe you work from home maybe like your home has some stress associated mm -hmm. with it and it's nice to just get out get to a hotel like there is an association mm -hmm. with people going to hotels and having a higher desire because there's that reduced stress that you're talking about and like the lack of associations with all of responsibilities mm -hmm. hotels bed and breakfasts airbnbs all of that i, I love how you're saying <laughs> resorts that, like, you're daydreaming, you're daydreaming <laughs> about it like i want to go to an airbnb <laughs> a cozy cabin in the woods the list goes on um yeah that's it creates a sense of new and different um together sent that sense of adventure so all right no one in the chat wants to give an eye any other ideas things that are new and different doesn't have to be sexual <laughs> all right fair enough fair enough we're here if you change your mind okay uh another strategy is to schedule a tryst or is it tryst 
I don't know. Esther Perel also uses this word, and I she is Belgian. I've never heard this word. T R Y S T. If anybody wants to look up how you pronounce that. Um, it is a romantic rendezvous, a private, secret romantic rendezvous. Oh, Mr. Johnny Two Shoes, you played the board game's monogamy, which asked some interesting questions. Learned some new things after 20 years. 20 years! I bet, I bet you have some secrets um, to success for 20 years that um, you're welcome to share if you, if you want to. But, Hopefully that helps some fizzle for sure. Yeah. So pick out the check out the game monogamy if you wanna have some sizzle. There's also like card games. Um yeah. let's get deep, I think is what it's yeah. called after or dark. Or something. Yeah, yeah. Um that's that's one that you could ask each other questions, mm -hmm. learn some new things, even after twenty years. So That's super cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Mr. Johnny Two Shoes. We appreciate it. Okay. So you remember were going it. into a word that I've never <laughs> oh. heard of before. I'm like, what was <laughs> I talking about? Rendezvous. <laughs> a rendezvous. It's a ro private romantic rendezvous. Okay, it's just a way to it's a way to make it sound more glamorous, and it should be glamorous. But really, we're talking about scheduling sex. And a lot, <laughs> which a lot of people struggle with the idea of scheduling sex. Again, going back to the myth of it should be spontaneous, you should have instant chemistry, and it should be effortless, right? And if I have to schedule it, should we really be together? Are we, is it really worth, you know, sticking it out? Yes. Again, think about all the important things you schedule in your life, right? appointments, dates with friends, family gatherings, meetings for work. What would your life look like if you didn't schedule the time for those things? Right, exactly. Your hobbies. You're not gonna spontaneously probably take a trip to Disneyland, maybe you will, <laughs> but <laughs> probably not. Some of the best things come from scheduling. Oh, just the other day I stumbled into a yoga class. I don't know how it happened, it just sort of happened. No, we, we schedule these things because they matter to us. They're important to us. We want to dedicate time for it. Your sex life really shouldn't be any different. So you can call it a tryst, tryst, however you say it. I don't know. It's probably a word from another language um, that I probably should have researched before tonight, but I didn't. Um, either way, scheduling a time to be sexual with your partner at the frequency that makes sense for the two of you. We've talked about this in past live streams. You do not have to have sex five days a week if that does not work for you and your partner. That really can depend on your, your accelerators, your brakes, your desire type. Um, what season of life you're in? Are you super busy? You have a lot going on? It just might not make sense that you can have sex at a higher frequency. So. There is no perfect number, but you know, for example sake, let's say, you know, one day a week, one night out of the week or a time over the weekend or something to that effect. Um, and you are intentional about that time together. And even if you don't end up having sex, it should be a time of pleasure, time of connection, a time of exploration. First time chat. <clears throat> First time chat, okay. General General Garo, what's existential crisis? That's a good question. Um, I can tell that you see us as mental health professionals. We are. We are focusing on pleasure and um, sex therapy. Um, that might be a question for a more general mental health chat. Mm -hmm. If this is related to your sex life in some way, please share more. We're happy to dive into it a little bit more. Um, but yeah, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, we're here if you have a more specific sex related question. I hope you guys are doing well. Thank you. You as well. Yeah, same to you. Wonderful. Yes, happy almost Thanksgiving if yeah. you celebrate the holiday. Yeah, where are you tuning in from, General Garo? I don't know if I'm saying that right. We'd love to hear. Back 
back to spontaneity of mm-hmm. sex. <laughs> <laughs> Me getting completely sidetracked by the chat box. Um, I think it's interesting how many people, if you suggest that, they're like, oh, no, like, I want it to be spontaneous, so it's exciting. It's mm-hmm. like, it's not exciting to look forward to having that, like, sex date with your partner that, mm-hmm. you know, when you first start dating and you have a plan for a sleepover or something like that, you're pretty sure probably you're going to have sex and you're pretty excited about it. Yeah. Why does this have to be different, right? Like, it's all about how you perceive it. Right, right. And I think that can help people when we think about a spontaneous desire type, they, they, they feel desire and anticipation of pleasure and the responsive desire type, you know, will also be anticipating that pleasure, but can begin that pleasure process leading up to it. So if you're a responsive desire type, I should cycle back a little bit here. You can kind of create a ritual or a transition around this scheduled triste. Um, a rendezvous that you have with your partner. So think about the earlier days when you were dating. What are the things you did? Did you take a shower and use like nice smelling soaps and perfumes? Did you shave your legs? Did you wear a certain outfit that you um, feel really good in? You know, what, what are the things you did to kind of like prime yourself for the experience? Those all can become kind of eroticized. Uh, with practice and associating that with your scheduled sex date. So um, I had another thought that I was getting to and then I lost it. Ah, it'll come to me. (laughs) It's okay. It probably wasn't that important. (laughs) It was the most important of everything I've said tonight and I lost it. No, okay. Um, Other things that you can do that can create like a routine or a ritual around your sex date can be um, putting a certain type of music on, maybe putting fresh bed sheets on the bed, could be using a linen spray, lighting candles, you're creating a little bubble and everything that goes into that are pleasurable for you and your partner. Okay. If you can make anything new oh. and adventurous at your house too, like new locations. Yes. Maybe your sex too. date is Add some adventure. Different, different room in the house each time. You know, that can create a sense of novelty. There you go. Great idea, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I feel like teasing you about that. <laughs> I feel like you're just like you're in some sort of like a I'm spicy, in a loopy mood. Like, I'm in a weird mood. I, I love it. You're spicy. I, thanks. It's good. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was a compliment. It but, was. It was a yeah. compliment. A little spicy. A little distractible. That's yeah. why we love you. A little, a little discombobulated <laughs> and unorganized. You can just say it. You can say it. No. Oh. Okay. Oh, I was going to say, if you're somebody who is a responsive desire type and sometimes anticipating that sex date, you know, could maybe create a sense of obligation or you feel a little bit of struggle around that, try to do things prior to that that elicit some, that are pleasurable that you can start to respond to. It could be listening to like um, erotica, like an audio... um, story while you're getting ready or reading some erotica or some sort of sexually explicit material that might help kind of get the ball rolling for you just thinking about sex spend time remembering the last time you had great sex and just remember that reflect on it you can even talk about it with your partner Mm -hmm. and that can kind of help that pleasure state to develop I think that's great. I was actually listening to podcast Pillow Talks, which is a sex therapist and her husband, if anyone's interested. And they've been asked if talking about sex so much makes them bored of sex. And they're like, no, the opposite. Talking about sex gets you excited for sex, Mm -hmm. keeps it on the forefront of your brain. Mm -hmm. Right. So like you were saying, sharing stories about previous sex experiences, Mm -hmm. talking about sex, that can definitely get it on the brain. 
Right, especially if you're talking about it in a positive way, right? right. Like reminiscing oh, together. Yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah, I believe that. And if you're somebody who's in the thick of life, life is really busy, you're juggling a lot, maybe work is a lot, or you're parenting and your kids feel like a lot, sometimes it just becomes like the last thing on the list and the furthest thing from your mind. So actually encouraging yourself to think about it. Um, give yourself a little bit of time and space. I bet there's, there's sexual mindfulness uh, exercises mm -hmm. on YouTube, some me meditations. Just spend time thinking about it. Remind yourself that this is a part of you and your life that you might have just, it's really hard to connect with. So take time to connect with that, even if it's just mental um, internally. Okay. Um, and then be willing to explore together. Now this is in the bedroom and in sexual ways. So create some variety. When you've been with somebody a long time, it's common that you just, you have your routine. You know how each other's body works. You know how to cut right to the chase. Who can have an orgasm faster? It's, and I think there's a time and a place for sex in that way, quickies, you know? But it's also important to create that novelty in your sex life. Try different sex positions. Try sex toys together. Maybe listen to erotica together. Maybe read each other erotica. Read each other erotica? Right. Like, right. <laughs> oh, right. right. You said that. Right. <laughs> you, you glitched for a second. I was like, you know, like, did you just repeat exactly what I just said? <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I do that. Feel the show. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I do that to you. You'll like say something that's like new and different, and I'll just repeat it like as if it was my idea. Go back, go back and listen to our live streams. I feel like I do that a lot, where I'm rewatching us, and I'm like, why did you just say the same thing Victoria said, like as if she didn't say it. Anyway, so write right, to each right, other like erotica. Sex, they text oh, sex sexting. stuff to each other, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I didn't have that down. I like that. You could sext each other. You could write sexy emails. Sound old. <laughs> <laughs> or Snapchats. <laughs> That's probably more the demographic of, of Twitch here. Snapchat each other. Oh my gosh, I need to go to bed. Um, <laughs> we could read a sex therapy book together. Esther Perel's book, Mating in Captivity, is wonderful. It really helps you understand all, pretty much everything we've talked about tonight and uh, so much more. Don't you love that title, Mating yeah. in Captivity? It's a fantastic book title. Um, her work is great. Sex Talks, which is the book that um, Vanessa and Xander Marin, married couple that wrote a book together. Uh, I can't think of any other like good books for couples. What about keeping the spark? Or, yeah, just like understanding what sustains a couple's sex life over a longer period of time. There's a book on my to read list called, I think it's called Magnificent Sex, where they interview couples that have, that have I guess as they would describe it, magnificent sex um, over really long-term relationships. Yes, it is on my to-read list that I think will create some further insight as well. Okay, and then make sure that the sex you're having is sex worth wanting. No one's going to want to put effort and intention and show up for these rendezvous if True. It's sex that they that is not pleasurable, and so this really involves communication, understanding one another's um, desire type, what are the contexts that create pleasure, and what feels physically pleasurable to each person. And if you have a female partner, the majority of women, most women, it's a requirement for clitoral stimulation for that partner to. Um, feel pleasure and achieve orgasm. So very common misconception that uh, women can orgasm through penetration alone. That is pretty rare actually. So um, if you're listening and 
you are not sure now, like, oh, I don't know if I give my partner enough clitoral stimulation, there are resources out there. Um, and there's plenty of women who don't really even understand their own bodies or how to feel pleasure. So masturbation is one way to learn your body and what feels pleasurable to you. But if you need some help in learning what feels pleasurable for you and also helping guide your partner, um, there are some good resources. So there's OMG Yes is one website that has um, actual tutorials and videos and visuals that um, teach you different ways of providing pleasure to women. It's a great tool. Uh, another is a book called She Comes First, and that is written, it's intended to be written for men, all about providing oral stimulation, cunnilingus, for a female partner. So those could be two great resources to learn more about um, clitoral stimulation and how to please your female partner. There is, there is an orgasm gap. If we're talking about heterosexual couples here, men tend to orgasm far more regularly um, than female partners do. Yeah, I think it's what, like 95% for men of the time they achieve orgasm mm -hmm. like 40% of the time. Yeah, I think it's somewhere Women around there. Orgasm. That's a big yeah. gap. That's a really big gap. So we need more, a better understanding, both men and women, to understand how yeah. vulvas and the clitoris function and how to provide pleasure. So your, your female partner might not be feeling a whole lot of desire if there isn't enough stimulation and pleasure happening. Mm -hmm. One final thought that I have in terms of spicing it up too is if you're wanting to try new things but you're nervous about it, there's a yes, no, maybe list. Have mm. you heard of this? You sent it to me, I think. Um, it's like, a, is it an electronic did, did one? I? <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> you can like fill it out and then your overlapping answers yes. with your partner match. Yes. Yeah, explain yeah. how that works. Yeah, so it's online and you fill out, they have different things of things that they think that you might be willing to try, whether it's bondage or role play or whatever. And then you answer, yes, you'd be interested in it. No, you wouldn't be interested in it, or maybe. And your partner takes that same test and they give you the results and they only share what you both agreed upon. So if you're saying like, yes, I wanna try role play, but your partner said no, they're not gonna give that information to not like embarrass you. Mm -hmm. um, they just give things that you both might be interested in. So then that can start some conversation there. That's a great story. It's like a little bit safe way. Yeah. 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 That and that's a fun way to do it. You know, it's like taking one of those like online quiz quizzes. Yeah. I think those are fun. Yep. Yeah, love that. And <laughs> I'm gonna do my best for anyone watching on YouTube at a later time to link all of the books and resources and previous live streams that we have referenced in the description box so that you can just go and find it um, easily. So I think one final note here, this is the, the last thing I have to say, is to remember, Esther Perel calls this the element of the third, I think is how she puts it, which is ironically how when we think about somebody else desiring our partner or our partner potentially desiring somebody else outside of the relationship, it's this element of the third, when she, that it can create a sense of lust by remembering our we don't own anyone and our partner can be considered desirable by anybody else outside of the relationship and is a desirable entity in and of him or herself so keeping that perspective i think keeps you focused and intentional in your relationship and keeps you appreciating what you do have and knowing that you know Somebody else could, could be another factor. And that is not to say everyone should go out and start cheating or, you know, any, anything like that. Just remember that, that we get kind of complacent in relationships when we've been in them a long time. We just assume they're not going anywhere. They'll, they'll be there tomorrow. I don't have to work too hard at this. And that is a slippery slope to um, forgetting to appreciate what you do have and put that energy and effort into your relationship. I think that's great. Yeah, be curious about each other. We don't know everything yeah. about each other. 
right? There's always a little bit of mystery, even to the person like Mr. Johnny Two Shoes has been with for 20 years, still learning new things. We are, we are still complex creatures and we don't know everything there is to know about our partners. True. And I think it's interesting that that comes from Esther Perel with her mating in that captivity because it sounds very primal, right? Like somebody else might be interested in, in yeah. your... You know, Makes you want to like person. stake your claim a little bit more. <laughs> I don't know you're like... <laughs> Like, oh wait, my my person is desirable. I'm gonna sink right, my that, claws, that's my, my teeth right. in a sexy way, not a controlling and manipulative way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it kind of can elicit some desire. When she interviews couples that have been together a long time, she asks, when do you feel the most drawn to your partner, the most attracted to your partner is when they are watching their partner in their element, doing something um, that they're good at, that they're skilled at, or when they kind of see their partner, maybe like talking and having a fun conversation with somebody else um, who might be seeing your partner as attractive or desirable. That is often when um, people will say that they feel the most desire for their partner. It's just, it's like that little bit of reminder, other people are watching your partner too. You know, don't get too comfortable. Keep keep yourself a little bit on the edge. I like it. All right. Thank you, Holly. That was very informative. And a little scattered, but hey, we did it. We got through it. Thank you for everybody who tuned in um, and who contributed in the chat. We appreciate your participation. Hopefully after our live stream tonight, you have uh, a better understanding of why we have this transition from lust to love and how to encourage some of those more lustful moments together and keep that spark going as you continue on in your long-term relationships. Um, I would love to know, whether it be in the suggestion box or if you're listening on YouTube in the comments, if you plan to take any of these strategies and implement them into your own relationship and let us know. All right. All right. That's it for us tonight. Everybody have a good night. We will see you. Have a good holiday. Next Wednesday at 8.30 p.m.